Okay, so welcome everyone. Happy New Year. Having some technical difficulties here. So we're talking about tonight, the basics, getting back into it. Back into the meditation. Meditation is a training. It is not about taking a break from your problems. It's about gaining the skill of what we call mindfulness. So the idea is that by being here, you are cultivating something new. You are changing something about yourself changing the way you look at things, the way you react to your experiences, the way you react to the world. You're learning about your experiences, you're learning about your mind, you're learning about the way you hurt and the way you help yourself, the ways in which we cause ourselves suffering, particularly. Because it's not the experiences that cause us suffering, it's our reactions to them. And so that's how we can say that actually meditation is quite easy, it's quite... Meditation itself isn't the problem. Running away doesn't solve things. It's, a sh it's always a shame when, uh, when people leave the center because here they've come to a place where they can actually deal with their problems and they're not able to. It's not something to be ashamed of, but it's a shame. A shame that they're not able to unable to take the right direction. So this is what we do in life, we find solutions. My body is in pain, I'll just move, or I'll change my position, I'll find some way to alleviate the pain. Right? If we have bad thoughts, we find some way to distract ourselves. If we have hard and odious tasks, we find ways to uh, ways to avoid or to compensate. So we allow ourselves to feel such stress and, and suffering. Um, and instead of actually addressing it and, and alleviating it, we find ways to uh, we find ways to balance it out with diversion and and desire and sensual pleasure for the most part, or or pleasant ideas, pleasant thoughts, things we enjoy. And we have negative emotions, well, the, the old way was, of course, to distract yourself and find some way to make you feel happy. Now it's much more direct. We just take pills and because there's something wrong that we have to fix, right? Or even worse, perhaps, is to think that there is nothing wrong, that anger is okay. It's okay to be angry and fly into a rage. It's okay to cling. It's okay to be attached. My uh, my cousin passed away recently. Um, I, I wouldn't say we're quite quite close, but we've uh, you know, we've been close at times, and of course quite dear. But it's um, it somehow strikes one as odd as a Buddhist to be upset when he dies, right? To be sad, and yet. 
there's such sadness because we're so attached, we have such clinging. So I, I was asked just tonight. I was asked how I feel, how, how, what, or what I think about it, and I said, well, I don't feel sad. <laughs> I said, but I understand it's it's or it's normal to feel sad. I mean, I understand. I'm not trying to say that that there's something wrong or that you should try to uh, avoid or or deny that you're sad if you are. And as a Buddhist, of course, there's it's it's quite. Um, if anything, it's quite exciting because the person who's passed away is on to new and and. Uh, different things. So there's there's quite a bit of preparation and, and expectation involved in their in their lives. They have new challenges or perhaps the same ones over again. There's certainly no reason to feel sad except for the fact that we're so so attached to those we're close to. And so for his mother and father, and his mother asked me, and <laughs> she wasn't quite impressed by my answer, I don't think. And as I said, it's not the death that causes suffering, it's the attachment. I think for some people, they, they appreciate this attachment. They think of it as part of life, you know, a, a wholesome part of life. Pleasure and pain are to be had in equal portions and you wouldn't enjoy the pleasure if you didn't have the pain. So this is how we solve our problems, is by seeking out the pleasure and uh, rather than try to uh, eradicate the suffering, you know, to accept it as a part of, uh, a part of life. So in Buddhism, I, I think it's fair to say that we don't accept suffering as a part of life, per se. And acceptance is, to some extent, a part of it, but it's not quite acceptance, right? And it's not even suffering. We have this thing called dukkha. Dukkha. And so we get this idea that Buddhism says that everything is suffering. But it's not quite so simple. Dukkha simply means that which is a source of suffering. You know, like a fire. A fire can cause you great suffering if you fall into it. Of course, fire doesn't cause you suffering if you see it from afar just by looking at the suffering or acknowledging that the suffering is there, it's, or the fire, just by looking at the fire and acknowledging that it's there doesn't make you suffer. And that's why the Buddha said the source of suffering, the cause of suffering, is clinging, is craving, is desire. When you have expectations or attachments to things, when you wish for them to make you happy. So the training that we're undergoing, the training that we're looking to uh, to accomplish, or to achieve here, is to not suffer, is to free ourselves from all the baggage that we carry around about our experiences. We're not, we're not, we're not torturing you here. You're not tying to you to the wall and beating you. The pain we experience in sitting is actually quite minimal, but but because of our bad habits, because of our lack of training, we create all sorts of suffering out of the simplest things too hot, it's too cold, it's too loud, it's too quiet, it's too boring, too dull, it's too stressful. 
We create baggage. We create problems. And so a, a, a reassurance for you all is that in the beginning it can be quite difficult because you're untrained. Not because the meditation is, is stressful, but as you train yourself, once you're present, when you experience things as they are, it's quite peaceful. It's quite effortless. Well, it takes time to get there, but... And you get to the point where eventually you're able to experience things just as they are. And so our training is moment by moment to cultivate to cultivate new habits, to cultivate the habit of mindfulness. And that's the other part of what needs to be said is that this is about habits. Training is about changing our behavior. So it's something that has to be a habit and it's dealing with and combating our bad habits. So a lot of what you're dealing with here is going to be not just the wrong reactions or, or reactions that cause suffering, but habits of reaction. Meaning that you might think that at some point you've figured it out and you've solved your problems and you've changed your behavior, you've learned how to respond and how to react properly, but in the next moment or the next sitting or the next hour or the next day, it all comes back because it's about habits. And so this is why meditation takes patience. So what you're doing here and why you're doing it again and again and again is because the mind is only made up of, of uh, tendencies, patterns, habits. That's all we are. Our whole personality is just habits. And, which is exciting because you can change them. You can cultivate new habits, you can cultivate good habits, and uh, you'll find it much easier to live, much easier to be. Which brings us to the next thing that needs to be said is why we're doing this. Okay, we talk about being present, we talk about seeing things as they are. Why are we doing this? Why are we so concerned with, can't we just be happy with the way things are? Hey, things weren't so bad. When you come and meditate, that's one thing, is it starts to seem, mm, you know, things weren't so bad, maybe I should just quit and go back as it's challenging, right? Meditation is a challenge and there's a temptation to just go back and suffer, wallow in your ordinary suffering. But there are very good reasons to meditate. Our bad habits are quite dangerous. There's much danger out there. Death is a big one. Right? Maybe not your death, but the death of someone else. The death of those you love, the loss of things you love. And there are all sorts of dangers out there, the danger of suffering. And so much danger for those, for, for as long as we still have clinging, as long as we still have craving. The danger that we won't get what we want. The simple danger that will be put in situations. It's not even a hypothetical danger, it's like the danger we face every day. That maybe today we'll be put in a situation where we have to suffer not because of the situation, but because of our expectations. Because our patterns of behavior clash with the reality of the experience. At this moment I want to be entertained, I want to be pleased, I'm not being pleased. Reality doesn't accommodate our desires, doesn't accommodate our minds. And in fact, it can't because desire is something that accumulates. It's habitual and it becomes stronger and stronger. It feeds itself. So we become more and more desirous of the things that we want and more and more averse to the things that we dislike. 
That's why it's so st stressful to sit. You know, you sit and you think, God, oh, there's so much pain. It's not really. It's such a puny little pain, but you repeat the, the disliking of it again and again and again. You know, you don't like it, and, and then it comes again, and you don't like it again. Anything, the most minuscule thing, can drive you crazy. This is why we might be sitting and you hear a noise and it kind of irritates you. And then you hear the noise again and it significantly irritates you. And then you hear it again and again. And eventually you just want to blow up and yell at someone. Nothing to do with the sound. No, nothing to do with the pain. Nothing to do with the experience. Bad habits. You can see your habits forming. And then they become long-term habits to the point where, for most of us, we think it's crazy the idea that you could somehow be at peace with pain. I think pain is, is a problem. We're so ensconced in this idea, this bad habit, and believing that pain is a problem. So why we're doing it really in a nutshell is, is for this reason. And your ordinary life is fraught with problems, it's fraught with difficulties. If not yet, then, then to come. Looking at people who, who lose a loved one, and how stressful and how much suffering comes from that. When in fact, I mean, from a Buddhist point of view, it's like, what? They, they, they moved on, you know? It's like, be happy for them, or, or at least not happy, be, be more concerned for them rather than sad. There's nothing to be sad about. All we're sad about is our own, it's somewhat uh, selfish in fact. We're not sad because, oh, that poor person died. We're sad because, oh, poor me, I can't see that person anymore. How cruel am I, no? How cruel does that sound? Not very, not very compassionate, I suppose. But it's the hard truth that we as meditators start to face. It's not even a hard truth. It's a wonderful, liberating truth. To realize that we're only causing ourselves suffering. We don't, there's no rational reason when you lose something or someone. There's no rational reason to be upset. I said this to a friend of mine, she got very upset at me, she said, she thought I meant that we, or she knows that some people, no, she, she knew it would come across as um, telling people to deny their, their sadness. It's not about denying your, your grief, your shock. It's about realizing that that's a, it's a problem in and of itself. It has nothing to do with the loss. It's like, Oh wow, I'm, I'm terribly untrained, <laughs> unable to deal with reality. We're weak, no, that's really it, a weakness. So it's quite encouraging, you should feel quite proud, and not proud, but confident and encouraged and excited about how great it is to come and become strong. You know, the power that comes from just sitting through pain, even your body shakes, sweat pours out of your armpits, your head feels like it's on fire. To sit with that, to just say, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to succumb, I'm not going to let it vanquish me. It's quite, uh, quite encouraging. That's sort of why we do it, but the other part of why we do it is what do we get out of it, right? What are we going to get out of this? And I always tell meditators not to think about what you're going to get out of it, not to sit there and say, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Don't have expectations. They don't help. But if you're confused or, or, or a little bit unsure of whether you're actually going to get anything out of this. And we can talk a little bit about what you get out of it. And the first thing is purity. That should be a good, 
sort of uh, standard for you to live by during your practice, the purity. Because you'll feel, you don't have to be told what is impure in the mind, you'll see that which is r ridiculous and useless and harmful to you. That's the impurity. You can see it. You can see your mind as being so full of crap, full of garbage. You don't have to be told that it's garbage. You don't have to believe me that it's garbage. You'll see for yourself. You'll say to yourself, that's garbage. <laughs> that's useless. That's harmful. I'm hurting myself. So if you want to know what you get out of it, or if you want to have a sense of what you're getting out of it, it's purity. Through simply seeing and, and as a result adjusting the nature of your mind, you, your mind becomes pure by degrees purer and purer until until so many other benefits accrue to you you start to free yourself from depression stress anxiety fear worry doubt laziness you're able to overcome suffering you find that when there's pain, you're not upset by it. You're not. You don't suffer from it. You find that when things come that would normally make you, uh, would normally make you sad, you know, normally upset you, they don't upset you. And normally be averse to, you're no longer averse to. You'd normally be bored or turned off by. And you're able to bear with them mindfully and be at peace with them. You gain confidence. You feel sure of yourself. You, 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 fig you find the right way, period, the right way. You find the way that is true and right and pure and clear and noble. And finally you become free. You feel free. So right now what you feel during the course, for the most part, what you feel is, is entrapped. That's why many meditators run away, because they start to feel quite trapped and they, they get overwhelmed by it. But it's not the meditation that's trapping you. Meditation allows you to stop and see how trapped you are, because if you keep running around the cage, it's possible, like a hamster in a wheel, right? The hamster doesn't know it's in a wheel. I don't know. I don't know if it does or not. <laughs> Maybe they know and they're just getting exercise, but it's possible. If you run around in the cage enough, you can feel like you're free, not realize that you're bound, which, you know, it sounds kind of nice, but the truth is that there's great suffering. If you just keep denying the fact that you're suffering, avoiding it, right? You suffer, but then you, you avoid it. You find a way to fix it temporarily. So when you stop trying to fix it, you get to see how much suffering there really is. You get to see what you've sort of been ignoring about your life. See how trapped you really are. So don't be discouraged that the meditation seems to actually make you feel more trapped. I know how to be free, I'll just get up off the mat, start, you know, stretch. Go sit in a comfy chair, find a soft bed. That's how I free myself. Well, hopefully eventually that changes. Generally through the practice, that's what changes. You start to see that's not the way out, that's not what's trapping me, it's not the lack of a soft bed or a comfortable chair. It's the need for those things. It's the inability to stand the pain and the hardness and the discomfort. It's the inability to stand our own mind, our own presence, our own reality. Anyway, so there you go. There's some opening words, because this is the new year and this is our first broadcast and this is my first talk to all of our new meditators. 
except uh, we have Brenna is here. She she was reminds me that she was with us in Stony Creek. Couldn't remember where, but Brenna is here. Some of you know Brenna, I think. Javen is here. Javen was here last year. Javen might be a, a long term. We'll see how long he lasts. I've got two new guys, one of them staying for various periods. Maybe you'll get to meet them. There you go. That's the Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a good